slides uh, for this section, but uh, the first speaker couldn't come, so we have only one paper for this section. Um, so let's uh, invite the second speaker uh, to present on the topic we appropriate through uh, oxygenation the case of contingent par parking in the street of uh, Chinese cities. Let's go. Thanks to the chair and also a big thanks to uh, the organizer of this uh, workshop. And uh, my gratitude of course to Slug from you as well. Um, so, good morning, everyone. I hope you uh, get uh, back to normal a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I hope already get uh, some delays in the schedule. My talk uh, is uh, well, at least uh, initially the, the topic was about the real profit through application case of competitive parking. Well, which is of course what I'm, what I'm doing, um, but I have changed a bit my plan. That uh, is, I, I would like to share more about what I've been uh, observing and what I've been uh, doing uh, recently. And actually, I uh, split a little bit uh, this uh, uh, presentation into several parts. Um, first, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, myself uh, a little bit self -pr uh, promotion. Because um, I have a new face here. Um, I just got uh, my PhD last year from uh, uh, Belgian University. Uh, currently, I work at, at uh, uh, University of uh, Happy University of Technology as, uh, in the uh, Department of, of Urban Planning. Uh, but some people might find it a bit uh, confusing because uh, when I talk about my affiliation, um, Okay, so uh, I will be relocated to uh, Shanghai very soon. So um, I think uh, in the near future, if you if we maintain contacts, so it will be uh, I will be in Shanghai, which makes it a bit more easier for uh, for contacts somehow. So as I said, I, I defended my PhD uh, almost two years ago uh, in uh, Belgian University at Cairo Leuven. Uh, my doctoral project was about slum upgrading, but within the Chinese context. So here I use the, the italic, the italicized uh, the, the format, uh, the PIN format of the uh, unique type of uh, uh, well disadvantaged community in Chinese uh, in China, so Chen uh, Zhongsun, which is uh, or otherwise could be called uh, urban village. Um, well, uh, this project uh, starts uh, from um, a paper that I wrote uh, during my master's uh, period. Uh, it focused on the migrants to, to Shanghai and how they would uh, uh, contact with each other. I mean, the, the migrants come to Shanghai and they have different uh, communities. Uh, so how would, could they uh, maintain somehow a kind of loose social network to support each other? And eventually, it turned out to be a, a little bit more grander uh, project, uh, questioning the, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the formation of this kind of informal settlement uh, within the, uh, the whole uh, context of uh, uh, fast urbanization, uh, which is happening, uh, has happened, and is still happening in China. So. Uh, I would just uh, spend a few slides, okay. take some expert, uh, excerpts uh, from my uh, doctoral defense uh, PowerPoint to, uh, to, uh, to highlight a few points. First, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in English literature, the, um, there has been um, quite a lot of research, uh, research, research has done on uh, this issue. But there's a problem with the term. It's an uh, epistemological problem. So how do we really understand this, uh, this, this term? And if we give different terms to uh, use, apply different terms to kind of grasp the reality, and it also has uh, some, something to do with uh, uh, the series or the histories that uh, is endorsing the term that we are using. Um, Clearly, there has been several different terms uh, widely used in uh, English, lang uh, English literature. Chen Zhongsun is one of them, and even more popular is Urban Village. And some uh, scholars uh, would rather prefer uh, VIC, <coughs> that is, Village in the City. Uh, 
I would love to go into details of the, the differences between the terms because some other scholars, such as Xing Yu Tian, has done a much better job than me. Uh, I just want to highlight that uh, if we consider uh, the, I, uh, the term of urban village, it has its own history. I mean, when this term was uh, coined, it was by an uh, American sociologist um, who was uh, re doing research of the Italian uh, immigrants to uh, Boston, to, to, to America. It's a totally different context, even though we could uh, still figure out some compar comparability between uh, the Italians in America with uh, domestic migrants coming from the countryside to Chinese cities. Uh, so, I mean, for him, for Herbert Gans, this kind of dichotomy uh, of urban village vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, urban jungle, so we, which is much, l much worse situation. But what, uh, to, to him, it was clear that this, kind, this is kind of concept that he used as a uh, you know, it's 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 a it's, um, um, how to say um, for for the convenience of uh, the dis uh, description, and this is actually kind of a metaphor, which is um, which is easily understandable if you if you take, think about the, the, the kind of community. And yet, well, after this uh, term was coined, it goes. I mean, the the spreading of this term it goes viral. And when it crossed the Atlantic, and eventually, uh, when we again in the within the British uh, academic uh, world, when people start to use this term, they mean totally different things. Uh, well, you see a, 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 um, a lot of uh, researchers and some of them activists. So, I mean, this art part. Um, you have uh, a few historians, sociologists, and even um, urban planning uh, um, professionals. They use this term, and to them, this this uh, this idea of urban village is somehow you you to like YouTube utopian, well, semi or quasi utopian uh, community, which uh, has both the advantages of being urban while at the same time and maintaining. The, the live, uh, living scale of a village uh, with good uh, social networks, with good um, uh, mutual support. And then you have, um, uh, again, back to the United States, you have Jane Jacobs, you have New Urbanism, and so on and so on. So here, uh, if we consider this tradition that is different from sociolog uh, sociological uh, tradition, the urban village is used as an uh, a way to conceptualize the, the kind of community which is desirable uh, to the to uh, a, a certain group of um, uh, let's say scholars and uh, uh, planning professionals. That the two should not be uh, um, well should not be uh, mixed with each other. Uh, I also did empirical study on uh, on two uh, in two cities of China. Uh, one is um, Hefei and that is uh, Shanghai. Uh, I want to ask, uh, given the, the, the existing literatures on, on the um, analysis, all kind of analysis of uh, uh, the Chen the Zhongchun, I want to ask how do these inhabitants themselves, well, in discriminating of their origin or their hukou, I just care about the people who actually live within these kind of communities, how do they think of their, the place they are living? And there, there has been quite a lot of this, uh, researchers on the dichotomies. So either their rural or urban in terms of their their, their hunko, and or the land. I mean, the the, the terms are uh, legally speaking, it's a, it's a kind of collectively owned land. It's a lot part of the city. So are they the the islands within an urban world, or are they just being? Uh, there's a more uh, nuanced. Uh, Way that people could um, conceive their uh, the, the place uh, the place where they live, so I developed some kind of diagram and then uh, did a test of uh, to to the let's say uh, kind of survey and to see uh, if there's a little bit more um, that uh, than we uh, the things that we already know. Uh, well, it turned out that most of the inhabitants. Uh, they, they conceive the, the place they live not in black and white. It's, it's a kind of 
gradient. And to me, it reflects the way that people feel and the people uh, try to uh, understand the world. So even if you are just an uh, inhabitant of uh, Chengdongsun, let's say, and you can trans or you can somehow uh, also uh, make reference to the, the let's say slum and squat dwellers. How do they think about their, their community? And is this black or white? Uh, the, the result we got, well, uh, of course, there's also uh, quite a lot of uh, other uh, statistical analysis behind. Uh, but here, uh, it's, it's shown that uh, most of people think it's, uh, this kind of community is, is still rural, but it's, it's uh, within a gradient. It's not black and white. So. And uh, well, after a few chapters of uh, analysis, and uh, by the second uh, by the second half of the dissertation, I uh, try to uh, examine the, the ways that uh, people um, try to fight for for their right. Uh, because to me, the uh, the problem of uh, Chen Dongsun, or uh, for that matter, the problem of slum and squalor dwellers, uh, has a lot to do with citizenship. And from uh, at this point, I um, I'm indebted to uh, a Turkish uh, uh, scholar, uh, Ekin Isin. If uh, here's a Turkish scholar, perhaps he can correct my um, pronunciation. Anyway, uh, I found uh, I, I developed two dedicated two chapters to the study of the citizenship struggles. One is public art. That is how people, um, well both the artists and activists and also the ordinary people, if, even if somehow they're passively involved, they, they use uh, art in a way to um, articulate for their, uh, for their rights and for the, uh, well, for the uh, more open, uh, transparent, accessible uh, uh, way that they could uh, get uh, involved in the, in the city. Uh, here are just two uh, photos that I, uh, I, mean, re I refer to. Uh, one, I, I think this one is uh, very likely by M. Bensky. Uh, this one's Project Morinli, uh, which is quite uh, so quite famous. I'm not sure if it's that famous that you have heard about that. Okay, uh, the, the the second part of the citizenship struggle uh, goes to uh, slum tourism. Uh, it was an, uh, at the very beginning. It was a conference that I attended, which is. Uh, Fantastic! It's a, it talks back to the, the people who did slumming. I mean, in in the mid nineteenth century, the, the British middle <coughs> class they, they went to the the East End and to to see the dismal uh, realities of the the other world of London. And uh, but now, uh, well, by the by the end of the twentieth century, there's a resurgence uh, resurgence of uh, the. Um, slum tourism now but nowadays people do not simply go to the other part of their city but they go they, they, they are transnational uh, they, sorry they are international tourists they go um, far beyond the borders and you see the, the different uh, ways that people um, get involved well involved in, in a way uh, in the in the how to say in the life circle of slum so there there has been quite some critics uh, on the voyeurism of people. Uh, they, they, they are seeing poverty and they, you know, uh, these kind of things. And still, I try to uh, see the positive side of this uh, very controversial movement that uh, people, can, they're, they're coming and they, get, they want to, they have a willing, uh, no matter what, well, what um, dedicates it might be, at least there's a movement, there's a momentum of interaction, and on the front of the, a forefront of this uh, social crisis, that you have people coming together, and I, um, I think that's that's something uh, uh, in, could be uh, interesting. Uh, I, I forgot to add here is here is a tourist at uh, one of the most famous um, slum, uh, the Brazilian uh, favela, Rocinha in Rio de Janeiro. So um, it's quite. I, I think this uh, photo tells quite a lot. Perhaps tells more than what it really means. Yeah. You have the, the middle class, somehow white, gazing of the of the slum. Okay. Now let's come back to um, to the topic that I'm going to um, present. Actually, uh, I, I intended to.
present today. So first, uh, let me uh, introduce the city of Hefei. Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, really uh, known to the audience here, uh, because uh, let's say in the English language um, literature, there's very few uh, research, researchers on this uh, uh, research on this city. Uh, one exception is uh, another geographer from Hong Kong University, that's George um, C. S. Ling. So George Ling, uh, he once did a, a comparative work on on Hefei. So where is it? So first, I will try to. You see, I really made efforts to to locate the places that you have been talking about or you are going to talk about. Uh, it's easy to identify, but um, Hefei, the city, is just out of. Uh, out, uh, it's absent from the radar screen. Okay, now here it is. You see, it's halfway between Beijing and Hong Kong, and it's also inland. Uh, it's it's a lot. It's not famous for. It's not famous for something that we would talk about here. But for me, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting place because just because it's not famous, it's it's not so typical. It's uh, and on our side, I, I reckon this as something. Rather typical, it can be quite Chinese. Yeah. Um, there are some thing, some things that I, I find fascinating happening in the city. Even, well, I, I appreciate, uh, I especially appreciate the, the uh, one of the sp uh, speakers, um, Christina West. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other day, when you were talking about the postmodern is part of modern. And also, I, I appreciate one of the, uh, the audience who raised the question of uh, pre-modern. So, how do you think about uh, pre-modern with modern? Here in this city, I mean, economically, it's, it's insignificant, and well, it's insignificant in many other aspects as well. But here we have something rather, uh, let's say, something really avant-garde, but it's it's quite modern happening. Uh, people want to really making. A, People making efforts to greening, uh, to green their their city. Uh, on the on the street, you can find you can electronic uh, taxis, electronic bikes, and uh, electronic electronic buses. So um, this city got the got this uh, kind of uh, automobiles thanks to the local manufacturer of uh, uh, vehicle manufacturer. And I recently I get to know that uh, the many other Chinese cities have adopted or are adopting electronic um, vehicle taxis as well, uh, because they have been competitors in this market, and that's, that can be quite interesting, uh, I think. And the other thing is that uh, on the uh, well on the fringe in, in the suburb of the city, you have some artists and uh, social activists coming together. To transform uh, uh, an authentic peasant village into an artistic uh, artist's village. I mean, normally, if you think about this creative class and the the, the way that they build a community, let's say artist village, it's not a village. It's 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 somehow like uh, industrial uh, sites that are being regenerated into some loft, some posh, uh, also uh, has something to do with gentrification of these things that. Uh, people, uh, the artists use uh, this place as sites of uh, for their um, work and life. But here, it's it's really a, a peasant village. And people, why, how, how, how come this is made possible? Because if you think about the, the process of urbanization, that uh, peasants are losing their home, not uh, forcibly, but uh, at least ha uh, partly voluntarily, because they they are moving to the city. And they abandoned the village, and the village became vacant. Thus, you have people come, you have the artists coming in, just in the same way as the artists come to the industrial sites, the, the derelict industrial sites. Uh, uh, well, I won't comment on the, 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 the taste or the, the style they would like to follow, but uh, from the first sight, I was uh, really skeptical of this project because I thought these artists and the social activists, they they are by no means the, 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 the apologists of the or re supporters of the government. I was wondering how would the local government deal with this? Will this be a new site of rebellious uh, group, or 
would they be really against this project? But it was it turned out quite surprisingly. They got the whole they got really support from the local government. Uh, the local government helped them to negotiate with uh, the peasants. It's, they are a lot negotiating uh, individually now. They negotiate in a collective way. So if you want to move in, it's fine. As you pay a, a certain amount of uh, rent, and with a subsidy, a subsidy from the government, the peasants could uh, well manage to uh, to maintain kind of uh, urban life within the city, or at least support them to start small villages. So now uh, at this point, I began to to wonder again, will this village uh, prosper with the support of the government r rather than with the, from the, with the, the how say the suppression of the government? Now you've got a spot a support from the government, and so the local government really wants you to make something out of it. And then the question comes to that's a challenge for the, the activists and the uh, artists. What are you going to do there? Will this end up in some kind of just middle class exodus place in the in a suburban village, but you do not really do much thing uh, creative or uh, economically significant there? Then that, that will be uh, the, the new challenge, I would say. Um, so my initial topic was about uh, the contingent parking. Um, this is one of the two. Um, issue set, I'm, uh, I would like to spend a little more time on that. So why parking problem? Earlier this year you have uh, a debate going on on the website of the Guardian. So there was a conservative um, um, MP, let's say, um, I think it's Eric uh, Pickle, who proposed to, to loosen the, the control of parking um, to the uh, at the, the high street in English uh, in British cities, and then there, there's a poo uh, on the website of the Guardian. Uh, the result speaks for itself, so there's no need to um, explain a little more about that. So, why why do people? Uh, well, there was a reason, of course, uh, for um, for the MP to propose for the loosening, because people when if they, they come to a town by car. If they, stu if they need some more time to really just park their car and then come back to, 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 sh to shopping, I, I, he might have thought that this is not good for business. But still people, when they are given the chance to, to answer if uh, it is good or bad, most of the people, British people, suggesting it's a bad idea. Because if you think about the street, if you, th if you think about a lot of cars coming in to, to the town, then it's, it's, it, it will take uh, part of the space. Yeah. So uh, I come back to uh, Jean Jacobs when he, oh, sorry, when she uh, uh, pointed out that that's the, the destroyer of American communities. And I, I, I guess, uh, well, it's my personal guess that she was quite against the, the, uh, um, the uh, kind of uh, auto, um, auto society. Um, I mean, based on her uh, earlier work and, and so on. So the parking is a problem. Uh, parking means that it's not only the, 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 the uh, act that you uh, you leave your car at a certain place, but also it has a lot to do with where your car is parked and how your acts would affect other people's activities. So some, somehow, as um, urban planners, especially as uh, practicing urban planners, the world is much uh, simpler. You know, if you've got a contract and you start to to do some, actually some quite uh, scientific in, in a way, uh, measures of uh, of the uh, the requirements of the road, and then you give a beautiful uh, illustration, of, uh, or as much uh, creative as you can to render the kind of road that the, your client might be interested in. But the thing is that the, re the reality often turns a little bit tricky than what you have uh, anticipated. I would like to show you a few um, pictures that I took on the street of, uh, of the city where, I, where I'm from. Yeah. And I uh, mind you, this uh, it's uh, in uh, 
it's in mainland China, so the, the, the car goes to, to the right side, okay? And still you have the, the, the lady riding a scooter. Uh, she's not following I mean, I mean, the rule. And you have uh, this play, uh, this land, which is designated for, um, let's say, for, how should I call it in English? It's for bicycles, for scooters, and so on. Here you have the land for automobiles. And you see just people park here. It's unauthorized, of course. And in this place, which is supposed to be a pedestrian area, you have, of course, you have people coming here. But from time to time, as, I, as I'm going to show you in the next <coughs> few slides, that people also park car there. Um, and this became a problem, a really problem. As a driver myself, I also suffer a lot from this, uh, this both I mean, in, in terms of time lost on the, on the way and also uh, psychologically, I mean, it's, it's a lot of stress if you drive over there. Uh, this photo was taken, uh, let's say, at about 4 p.m. That is between rush hours, the noon rush hour and uh, the evening rush hour. The street was uh, rather clear in this way. Still, you find uh, this uh, young man uh, also on a scooter. He was uh, driving uh, on the um, automobile then. Uh, I won't blame him because I'm a native to that city, uh, and also because I I notice and I uh, I think you can also you could also notice that uh, the, there are cars on the lens, which was I mean, I mean designated for for him. But he had very little choice about doing this. This was, as I said, it's not a rush hour. I just imagine if you were your driver, you're behind the, the wheel, and he, during the rush hour, it's, uh, it's something quite stressful. Uh, be very careful, uh, a driver, and you lose a lot of time. It's, it's totally different from the case where, where you can, what you can see here in Hong Kong, you have the, the buses uh, driving really fast, because it's older here, it's, uh, it's clearly demarcated. And you have here, uh, as I said, you have the, the cars parking on the uh, authorized uh, plots. You have cars parking on the unauthorized plots. And you even have cars parking on the pedestrian pass. So that, that's miserable. How come there are so many cars parking here? Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Um, well, it, it's easy if you think about the way the, the, the Chinese city is getting, um, let's say, auto, it's not automized, but it's coming um, to an age of automobile. In 2009, they have uh, just less than a quarter of, uh, of a million uh, registered automobiles, and this uh, term here includes uh, um, trucks and lorries and so on. Uh, in the central districts, that's the city per C uh, of Hefei. Uh, you have uh, this number of uh, parking lots. By that time, parking was still free. I mean, except for a few um, guarded uh, parking lots. Most of the places that you do parking is free. It was not a, a yet a big problem uh, at that moment. But just uh, just by that time, the authority realized that the, the, there's an incoming wave of, uh, of uh, automobile, that people are getting, uh, well, getting some fortune, and then now they can afford uh, a car. So uh, about uh, one uh, ten thousand temporary parking lots were assigned just to handle the problem that the, the, the government has already sensed that, that there's a huge change in the uh, cityscape with more cars coming in. Yet it was a, such a, hard, a rush that <coughs> many of them designated the, the temporal parking lots, which means uh, the parking lots that you set aside on uh, the roadside, was unfit for this purpose because they were some of them were, were, were assigned along the road, which makes the congestion even worse. So uh, one of the uh, solutions that the government comes up uh, with is to um, to levy a parking fee. So the rationale here is if you pay more, it's, it's raise your cost of uh, owning a car, of uh, driving in the city, then you would think twice before you um, 
uh, uh, static engine. There's also a legal framework which uh, sanctions uh, the whole um, uh, activity. And from the second and uh, third part, you can see that uh, it's uh, sanctioned by the government to uh, assign uh, parking lots on the, on, along the road, uh, on the auto land, and uh, even on the pedestrian paths, because you cannot do much thing uh, over light to change the, the urban fabric, uh, which suits the, the traffic before, but not now and even less of the future. Then, uh, just within, let's, let me remind you the, the year we were talking about just, uh, just now, it was 2009, and within four years, the, num the number of registered o automobiles uh, quadrupled. I'm not sure if I'm using the correct word. It's four times before quadrupled. Yeah, and that's, that's crazy. Uh, but since automobile industry was one of the priority, uh, priority um, yeah. uh, section of, uh, of the government, so um, so the it just comes on and on and on. So uh, the problem with uh, parking is, uh, it, it, although it has not yet uh, reached, let's say, a public um, uh, uh, how to say attention. But it has, has already been, already been uh, quite a um, uh, critical issue of the city. Um, uh, given the limit of time that I, uh, that I have, I want to uh, just go quickly to the theorizing part. First, I'm really, um, I'm really happy. I mean, I, I, I believe there's some kind of coincidence because the first people, the first uh, delegates of this workshop that I spoke to was. Uh, Mr. Solomon Benjamin, we met in the elevator. Uh, the, you are the first uh, delegate I spoke to. Yeah, I, I read your uh, work uh, when I was still a PhD student about uh, OQ, occupancy urbanism. But uh, of course, I'm, I'm using it in a little bit different way. So um, this, I think, the, the the thing is that with those cars that we see, we saw just now on the, of the photos, they're parking on all authorized places, and they risk the, the the fine from traffic police and also from the urban management um, uh, staff. Still, they do it because law enforcement is very difficult. It's a costly business to to um, enforce law to every corner of the street. So they're they're occupying the the, the street. In a way, that perhaps there are, there's no politics inside. It's just they, they do whatever they want, kind of laissez fear uh, at this stage. But the externalities, to borrow the, the economic term, the exert of the city in general that is changing and changing the uh, cityscape, and it also has made the street very unpredictable. I, I, I would reiterate this word, unpredictable. Which it could be reflected on the, a lot of um, accidents. Which, uh, well, while the mi uh, major accidents can be uh, recorded, and many of the minor uh, accidents just go unrecorded. And I would also to draw your attention to sink of the car and the embodiment of a certain space. Uh, I'm not sure at this stage if there has already been quite a, be a literature on, on this topic. But to me, the car, if it, once it comes, uh, arose out of the, the production uh, workshop, then it takes part of the space. And if you think about the modern apartments, you live, you live, let's say, up in the air, and down in the basement, you have the place for a car. It's, it's kind of body, as if it, do, uh, it doesn't speak, right? It takes part of a, a space, and you have to go along with it. And wherever you park it, it takes part of a space much more than your. I mean, your body would uh, occupy. So, is there something kind of identity that we could ascribe to the to the cars that we're using? And certainly, uh, I have to really go very fast. The, the social psychological response to increasing traffic. I would like to um, bring up a, a German a traffic psychologist who created the, the the sign at the the pedestrian cross. You know, it used to be just red and. Green and um, orange, but if you nowadays you, we get used to the, the people moving or you know a red red people stopping things like that, and I think it has something to do with road rage. I mean we're talking about nowadays, 
you feel you feel really bad if someone just uh, pull in in front of you. You feel somehow uh, offensed. But if you really think strictly, do you have a right of the space that in front of your car? Yeah, you have the right. But according to traffic uh, regulations, you have a right to to go. But how do you claim the right to space just in front of your car? Right. And that's something quite psychological. Um, I, I, I had still uh, haven't get a clue how to um, go a little further on this thread. Um, then uh, so I have to skip a few uh, slides. But you, you see here, I mean, the second topic, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. It's um, CCTV uh, cameras on the Chinese streets. And if you think back, there's no uh, system. And well, I want to go further on that. Uh, for uh, at least uh, seven years, the Chinese uh, government is uh, promoting a project uh, which literally could be translated as a Skylab project. That is to uh, install, uh, uh, read a lot, a lot of cameras uh, in the street on the streets of Chinese cities and towns, and it goes even down to villages to to monitor the what's happening there. <clears throat> and this term uh, Skylab in Chinese comes from uh, an idiom. Uh, which reads, uh, well, uh, could be translated uh, in English in this way. That is, the sky let, will never let anything uh, go. It's an ambitious and somehow authoritarian um, attitude, of course. And, uh, well, there has been quite some uh, uh, researchers on the CCTV uh, projects of the world, a lot about uh, the, pro uh, the, the CCTV. TV um, system uh, in UK, uh, some uh, in Germany, and some uh, in Aust uh, Australia, and so on. So if you think about the, the Chinese case, you've sensed the very uh, typical top-down hierarchical uh, system. Well, uh, some scholars have compared the Australian uh, case with the British case, and saying that the, the Australian case was much looser because there's no strong central uh, Motive to, to promote this. Uh, I'm not sure how, how strong would the British case be, but um, I'm quite confident the Chinese case is one of the most uh, hierarchical of the, of the world. And it's amazing that you find, I mean, in the city where I live, there has been more than 600 villages uh, installed the CCTV system. I mean, it's, it's modern and even hyper modern when. Some of the villagers are still living a pre-modern life. It's, uh, it's a ju this juxtaposing is, is uh, astonishing. And you have uh, the involvement of authority, of course, and domestic and foreign companies. You have it's, it's really a big business. The city where I've come from invested uh, just more than let's say um, more than 500 million US dollar uh, in this project since uh, 2011. And now this project is near completion. You have uh, some American companies, and you have also Chinese companies working on uh, this project. It is debated, of course, on social media. But the thing is that there's a lot of uh, debates goes on uh, around the the actual cases because there are so many cases, so much con controversies uh, related to the cases. But uh, intellectually, uh, reflection are still. I mean, it's um, it's a it's in, in death. So even worse, it has much less uh, law uh, regulation yeah. Yeah. Uh, of, this, uh, of this kind of activity. And uh, absence of resistance is not, not like in Germany, where you have uh, activists really uh, breaking, the, uh, destroying the, the, the cameras as a way of protest. So the consequence is unknown, at least from this stage. Um, I would like to quote the, uh, Naomi Wolf's term is no totalitarianism of civilian te technology. Talking about the uh, uh, totalitarianism of technology, have so many uh, things to, to do, but here it just we make it very uh, very uh, uh, particularly uh, focused on civilian technology. That's uh, what, it, what she said is quite. Uh, I mean, you, you sense it when you read it, right? It's, it's not just the, the, those uh, suspects, it's not uh, criminals, it's you and me. And I, I read from one research that uh, the British citizens 
on average, it got 30 times caught on CCTV uh, cameras every day. I'm um, not sure if uh, this is really the case, but uh, that was quite, quite something. And talking about the response or resistance, that's quite, uh, as I said, very little uh, serious and inter well serious uh, and intellectual reflections on this. And uh, among very few uh, people who raised this issue, one uh, of them is uh, the artist Ai Weiwei. <laughs> Well, personally, I'm not really a fan of uh, him, but I think this work was uh, fantastic. It's so solid and it's, uh, it's really imposing. And yeah, I'll just uh, I'll go to the, the case study I've, uh, we've done. I mean, me and my um, um, colleagues have done uh, two uh, case studies. I'll just show you one of them. So you have uh, an urban fabric here, clearly can be seen, and you have the, the lens of the streets. In the exercise, you will see uh, I use different uh, symbols to, to um, indicate the cameras which can uh, turn around, that is uh, a round one, and also those cameras that's, uh, fo uh, that is um, focusing on one direction. Here you see the density. Well, I didn't do the uh, uh, half uh, I Of course, I did go around, but here you have the, the elevated road. Here you have the man of the rain roads. Uh, I, just, I think it's too, um, I'll say, too crowded. So I just do this part. You see, there are most of them are uh, yellow rings, which means the the cameras installed uh, within the framework of this project, the Skynet project. You have those green ones. Uh, that I'm not sure. I I, I kind of. Uh, uh, things that they belong to private companies, so um, it's, it's there, it's not uh, signed. And for all other red um, arrows, uh, the, the arrows, the direction of an arrow indicates the direction that the, the camera is facing. So you have here, if you walk along here, guess how many times you will be caught on the camera. So it's, it's really a, a let, you, can, you have nowhere to escape. Um, we did also a small uh, survey, uh, sample size is not uh, great, uh, still we, we found some uh, interesting outcomes have, uh, and here on the balance is it's also a bit problem with the balance of the sex uh, from the sampled, so from the sampled, uh, yeah, yeah, let's say, passerbys. And uh, we asked them, uh, so, um, how how do you um, how do how, let's say how do you feel about the CCTV system? Does it, it is it is it making you feel safer, or it is an, an how to say encroachment to a private areas that make you feel less uh, privacy? And you find uh, you find here the, the differences between the two sexes. Um, for for male. Uh, well, they, their, their ideas are quite clear, so either positive or negative. Uh, for female, some of them are not quite uh, sure about this. So, um, I mean, considering the, the size of the sample, I, I'm not saying that this is really uh, the, the case. Uh, but within the limit of, the, of this um, pool, you could find something like this. And then we ask them, um, um, have you ever tried to uh, retrieve some pieces of the, the CCTV recording if you have some thing, let's say you've got stolen, you've got robbed and things like that? Um, interestingly, well, it's been more than confirmative and negative. You have some people that simply don't have an idea about what's going on. So perhaps if we remind them, okay, look, there's camera, but they have no idea if this, that has anything to do with their life. Even if we ask them, if you uh, have you ever tried to to get it, um, here you find the, the confirmative that mean, which means that the, uh, the the people who uh, have tried to get access to these recordings, they're all male. Given the limit of the pool, I'm, uh, I'm reiterate, reiterating this. So. Only male has ever tried to get access to that, and most of the <coughs> sorry uh, female um, interviewees let's say they have never tried this. 
uh, here is one of the dialogues. Uh, uh, we, we, we had main dialogues, and one of the dialogues uh, we, we had. So we asked them, ask them uh, three questions, so you could, you could see their response. <clears throat> this looks real. <clears throat> Indeed. And yeah, I, I sort of uh, gave it some uh, summaries or conclusions, but I found this uh, beyond my reach. So this is my contact. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, perhaps we can, actually, uh, we can entertain uh, one or two questions. Because uh, actually, we ran out of time, but we still have. Um, we can still entertain one or two questions, I think, before the coffee break. Any questions? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you uh, uh, talked about a number of different things. Uh, I uh, was very interested in the final part, uh, dealing with the surveillance of, uh, of uh, villages and cities and so on. Um, did you know that these cameras and new, uh, new cameras uh, provided by uh, the American company Cisco can catch up voices at the payment? So if people, yeah, <laughs> so it's quite a uh, uh, neutral service system, uh, actually, that is, uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, actually uh, introduced across uh, all across China. Um, uh, when you spoke to the people and asked them about uh, what their feelings were about the cameras in their blocks where they live and so on, um, I was a little bit interested in how you posed the questions. I could see uh, the short dialogue over there. But I'm thinking that if uh, people would feel uh, in some way threatened by being surveyed in this way, Perhaps they might not uh, want to discuss it with someone. Uh, just so I'm a little bit interested in the context. When you, how did you handle when you did the interviews like this? Did you just uh, go up and talk to some people, or um, what? Well, I think you have raised a very interesting and important question about it's not. I think it's beyond the methodology. It's, it's the way that you, you do research, and indeed it's a big problem because um, when I was making my um, PhD, it's about um, the, the, the urban village and uh, in Chinese context, and the, when, when, I was, when I tried to approach the people, both from, let's say, the party secretary, uh, the, the community, and also the people who uh, live there, uh, yeah, you, have, you, you get a lot of rejections that people don't want to talk about this. And eventually, this led to the a little bit uh, screwed result of your survey, even if you tried your best to do that. And I could not, I could do nothing but to keep a clear mind of that. And I put it very clear that during the field work, uh, you, you still get a lot of people falling out of your of your map, right? And in this case, the same thing. Um, we did this as. Um, like we're a lot really uh, very formal. It's just like you approach people who would pass by while we were taking notes of the uh, of the cameras. So we, it, it's not a, a very formal way that we, we do with uniforms or something. Just uh, yeah, thinking that those who would be worried yeah. about the increased surveillance and so on, they might not want to talk about. It. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So <laughs> the. I think in, um, if we were uh, talking about this, uh, whatever you, whatever you do, there will al always be some um, how say bias or let's say screwed result in, in this. But it, what we can do is really to be uh, more informal, as much informal as we can, and still at the moment we, we try to at the same moment we try to um, have some exchange with people. We, we do not always. Um, uh, Propose the questions in this way. See, uh, it's uh, it's a bit more informal. And then, when we uh, take note of the dialogue, we try to put them <coughs> within the same box. You see, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh.
The last question. I I I don't want to. Uh, it's it's a great uh, it's a great insight. Thanks. I, I don't want to overemphasize the difference, but the thing is, I see uh, 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 like a, quite a bit of ambiguity because there's a difference in which the transportation system that you're talking about and also how people respond to that. You know, like I mean, they're definitely not necessarily like an American response, but I don't want to nationalize this. You know, so I don't, I'm not using the word Chinese. You know, but but I mean, it, it looks a little bit like. Uh, I mean, a little bit more like Indian than than, than, than American. You know, like I mean, the way the motorcyclist uh, uh, runs and, and yeah. there's people park and like, park on the on the pavement and you know, that kind of stuff. So I, I, I'm just I'm just wondering how how do you how do you begin to analyze this? Because you know, like I mean, you, you you have one framework that you're taking. You know, if if these are separable or, or if there are only two, I don't know. But one framework about this transportation system. You know, like based on probably trip analysis and, 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 and uh, road rates and whatever you know, like comes from that. And then here's how people respond. You know, I mean, they, 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 how do yeah. things are listed? Yeah. Uh, well, that is there a difference? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the last question? Is there, is, there a real dif is there a difference that, I mean, I highlighted the difference. Is there really a uh -huh. difference? If there's a difference, how, how, how is it different? Uh, well, I'm not sure if I really understood your question, but uh, my my interest of uh, to, on this topic uh, originates from my um, observation as I was turning uh, I'm turning myself from a geographer into an urban planner. Let's just let's say if a mathematics and you have ma applied mathematics, and to me, urban planning is like applied geography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you, when you get to the, the detail, when you get to the practicals, and you have you find the the, the Big differences uh, from what you've learned or what you believe in, what you think, which is ideal, uh, from the reality. It's, it's quite different, and I, I agree. I totally agree with you. I think there's more similarities between uh, Chinese case and the Indian case, um, and perhaps for for uh, in, for this matter, also with other developing countries, which is getting urbanized, they're getting more automobile on the road. Um, you see, I've been. Um, in Belgium for quite a few years, and it's, it's very different from, from country to country. Even in Belgium, it's not that as rigid as what I sense here in, in, in Hong Kong or perhaps also in UK. The people do not drive in the way, the, the Belgian people do not drive in the way like people here or in the, in the, in the UK. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting, it's, a, it's an interesting world that people use uh, the streets and, and perhaps also uh, I feel, f from this point of view, I, I sympathize uh, a lot with uh, researchers that um, Indian scholars have been uh, have been doing. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I I think uh, we can continue this discussion during the coffee break because uh, we will have three papers in the second section. So we definitely need a cup of coffee before the start of the second <laughs> section. Okay, so let's go into another cup of coffee. Thank you. Um, as Joanna said, uh, there will be three papers for coming, so you definitely need a break before that. Let's go. Yes.